Good afternoon and welcome to another Physiology Friday. Today we are talking about training for power and capacity using heart rate zones. And today's presentation, shout out to the one and only, number three on the field, number one in our hearts, All America, Syracuse Lacrosse, Billy Ward, all around good guy and family man. So Billy has the uh, honor or the uh, the distinction of being this week's honoree. And um, many thanks, much love to my man, Billy Ward, for uh, encouraging me to get this, to get my knowledge out there. And so without further ado, on with the show. Maybe. All right. So starting out with some operational definitions. We're, as, um, as usual, we're going to be talking about heart rate values today. So with, with the heart, uh, there are act, there are essentially three beating patterns of the heart. You have tachycardia, bradycardia, and then the normal beating pattern. So tachycardia is an elevated heart rate. With tachycardia, when the heart is over 100 beats a minute, it engages in a beating pattern that is different from when it is at rest. The, the filling pattern is different. The heart expands to a, a greater volume. And so there's, there's a different physiological processes going on when my heart rate is over 100. Between 100 and 60 beats a minute, that's where the heart is typically in its normal beating pattern. And then for the sake of the argument, when the heart rate is below 100, I mean, excuse me, when it's below 60, it's in a condition called bradycardia. So we're going to be looking today at what's going on when the heart is in tachycardia and also when the heart falls out of tachycardia back into that normal beating pattern. Uh, jumped ahead one. Sorry about that. In terms of our training effects, so we've talked earlier, earlier in this series about the, the three heart rate zones, green, yellow, and red. When the heart rate is in the green zone, we're burning fats as our primary fuel source and we're burning them aerobically. When we are above 90% maximum heart rate, when our heart rate is in the red zone, there we're getting some lactate building up. Uh, the, uh, there's a, a good discussion on this archived on YouTube, on my YouTube page with the push and pull of lactate. So go back and check that one out. And then when we're in that yellow zone, that's where our body is burning carbohydrates aerobically. And we've talked about avoid the middle, the Charlie Francis principle, uh, Coach McConnell New, with New Jersey in the National Hockey League also talks about avoiding the middle. So we're either red or we are green. So when we're looking at our training effects, when we're training for power, the, during the interval, our heart rate is going to be in the red. And then in terms of power, from a biomechanical standpoint, power is force times velocity. Power looks at the rate of ATP production. So how much ATP are we producing at that instant? And looking at our three energy systems, we can either have alactic power, lactic power, or, or, or aerobic power. So if we're in the red zone and we're jumping up there, after about 20, 30 seconds of work, and our, the duration of that interval is only going to be 90 seconds on in, that's going to be a, develop, a developer of lactic power. If we are gradually bringing our heart rate up to the red zone, so if we ramp our, our heart rate from green to red over the course of 45 seconds, a minute, 90 seconds, and then we hold it in that red zone for three minutes, five minutes, we're going to be developing, uh, that's going to be a high-end aerobic stimulus. And if we let the heart rate drop all the way down to 99, if we let the heart fall out of tachycardia, that's going to be a power stimulus. So when we're thinking about power, the key is that we're looking for full recovery. Think about it for the people that do that engage in resistance training. When we're working alactic power, 
So we're doing a set of heavy bench press. We're doing five rep, five sets of five reps, and it's a heavy bench. And then we will do uh, a set of five. We'll rest for anywhere from a minute to three minutes up to five minutes. And then we'll do another set. We're letting the body have full recovery. So that is going to be a power stimulus. Now, the next one we take a look at is going to be capacity. Capacity is synonymous with repeatability. So here, from a physics standpoint, we're looking at work. Work is force times distance. So what we're, what we're trying to do in capacity is extend how long my athletes can generate a given amount of force. So let's say, for example, we're working with a, a track athlete and their goal is to run a four-minute mile. Well, a four-minute mile is 30 seconds per 200. So what we're going to do in terms of building capacity is do repeat 200s in 30 seconds until pace falls off. And then once let, and then let the athlete fully recover and then start doing another set of capacity work of, of capacity intervals. Um, so we'll, uh, this will make a little bit more sense as we get into our next slide. A little quick, um, quick history of the background. This is my man, Billy Ward, today's honoree. Uh, we don't have the, the, uh, the video background, little technical difficulties. But this was uh, Billy scoring the overtime winner against North Carolina back in 2014. And this was the ESPN top 10 highlight of the night. Uh, overtime winner, April 2014. Phenomenal, phenomenal. So uh, this, you'll, we'll, see, we'll see Billy scoring the game winner throughout today's presentation. All right, taking a look at our Recovery zone etiology. So the, the history around the origins of recovery heart rate zone training, I owe it to this guy right here, um, my mentor, my friend, my former landlord, uh, Dr. Jim Kellogg, also known as JK. Uh, and uh, he was just, just um, I got a little technical difficulties here. You know, we are, we are going live, so uh, give me a second. All right. So we are back at it now. All right. So recovery zone, my man, JK, uh, back in the day, back around 2005, 2006, J.K. and I had an exercise, phys, exercise physiology lab at Florida A&M University. And I would do my bike training protocol in the mornings with J.K. And then in the afternoons, I'd go out and I'd do my run workouts. So one day we did the bike work. We did the bike protocol in the morning. And I went out and I did my run workout. And when I got back the next day to do the bike protocol, J.K. asks me, what I did for my run. And I told them I did a fartlek. So a fartlek is pieces of, it's, it's intermittent, intermittent bursts of two minute, uh, two of segments of hard running and segments of easy running. And so on that day, I did what I call two minutes on one minute off. So two minutes fast, one minute jog. And so JK asked me, well, what did you do? I said, well, two on one off. And he said, well, what did your heart rate recover to? And I said, I don't know. And JK said, well, then all you really did was a hard workout. You did a lot of hard running interspersed with some jogging, but you really didn't get any specific training effect. What you need to do is let your heart rate fall below 100 because then it falls out of tachycardia. So when the heart rate falls below 100, then um, I have achieved complete recovery. My body has returned to homeostasis, which is the constant stable environment that it was in before the run began or before the workout began. And now I am 100% ready to go into my next interval. So 
Heart rate below 100 also correlates with a return to nasal breathing. So we've been talking a lot throughout this series about training in the red zone or training in the green zone, avoiding the middle, avoiding that yellow zone. So if I can breathe through my nose, 100%, if I can breathe in and out through my nose, I am completely recovered. So now I'm able to go back up to a faster pace where I have to breathe through my mouth. So what we're looking at here, again, avoiding that middle. If I have to breathe through my mouth, I'm in the red zone, I'm good. If I can breathe through my nose, I've fully recovered, I'm good to go. So that is our, that's the heart rate below 100, and we're gonna use that to develop power. Power, the ability to do work quickly. So this is gonna be full recovery. Now, let's take a look at what's going on here with my heart rate going to the top of the green. So basically, I have two recovery zones. I have my going to below 100. We'll talk about the actual number on the next slide. And then top of the green is going to be my incomplete recovery. So if I'm doing a workout where I want to develop capacity, I want to develop repeat sprint ability. I'm gonna let my I'm gonna let the heart rate recover to top of green. Top of green is 180 minus age, plus or minus that correction factor that Math Mathetone talks about. So what's going on here? I let my heart rate recover to the top of green, which means I have returned to a deep aerobic state where fat is being burned as the preferred fuel. So I'm going to be aerobic, I've gotten out of the yellow zone, and now all of a sudden I'm ready to go back up into the red zone. So quick recap, if I'm looking for power, I want to let that heart rate drop below 100. If I'm looking for capacity, for repeat sprint ability, or repeat surge ability for my endurance crew, I want to let that heart rate drop down to the just the top of that green zone. We have a heart rate graph coming up in a couple of slides. Now, moving on, if you looked at my Instagram post, we had Billy Ward, my, my favorite lacrosse player of all time. And then we had Paul Rabel. Uh, Paul Rabel at um, back, so back in the day when, uh, when Billy Ward was training to play for uh, the Charlotte Hounds of Major League Lacrosse, this was back in 2014, right after he graduated from Syracuse, getting ready to move into the pro ranks for the 2015 season, Billy asked me to help him design his, his conditioning training. He's, he's a strength and conditioning coach. He has his uh, CSCS certified strength and conditioning specialist, and he was good with the resistance training. But what he needed help with was the conditioning aspect. So we started using the the JK principle, and we started using the top of the green principle. So we were looking at training for power or training for capacity. Now you're wondering where does Rabel fit in? Well, at the time, back in 2014, 2015, Paul Rabel was the best lacrosse player on the planet. And he just happened to wear number 99 on the field. And so the jersey number and Paul Rabel and Billy Ward and Major League Lacrosse, this is where sports psychology intersects with exercise science. So Billy is out doing these incredibly hard workouts, these incredibly hard run workouts at five, six in the morning. And he's working harder than anybody else in the lacrosse biz is working. And he's dropping his heart rate to below 100. So what I said was, hey, Billy, you're training to take on Rabel. You're training to take on number 99. So instead of saying, let's train to drop the heart rate below nine, to, be, to below 100, let's train to drop heart rate to 99. And that will be a psychological reinforcer of why you are out here training at this at this in a uh, crazy hour of the day with sun he had this he's out training sun's not even up yet 
oh yeah, I'm doing a heart rate rec recovery workout to 99. I'm out here to prepare to take on Rabel. So heart rate below 99, or when the heart rate hits 99, our heart's out of tachycardia, and we can consider this complete recovery. So let's take a look at how we can use this, how we're going to use heart rate going to top of green or, or to 99. And I spoke a minute ago about if I'm training a, a runner to run a sub four mile. So they're going to run each 200 meter segment of a mile in under 30 seconds. We're gonna, so we're going to base this on the psychological principle of successive approximation. What I want to do eventually is take these, this four by 200 segment, and over time, that's going to become a four by 800 meter segment. These, these four 200s will become two 400s, and then it'll, they will eventually become one 800. So what we're doing here in terms of building capacity, we do a 200, let the heart rate drop to top of green. We go again, run another 200. Heart rate comes up above the red zone. Let the heart rate drop to the top of green. Do another repeat, bring it up to the red. Let it drop again to the top of the green. Let it Start another interval, bring it all the way up to the top of the red. That's going to be one set. So that's one set over here. The next thing I'm going to do is when I'm done with this cluster, I'm going to let my body have full recovery. I'm going to let that heart rate drop all the way down to 99. When it hits 99, we go again. So we have our micro sets in here. We have our micro clusters in here where we are building capacity. And then the, the actual main set right here, that, that one cluster, after that, we let it fully recover. And now we're going to build a power. Now we're going to have a power stimulus. So then we come up, we do another set of four, same principle over here, up to the red, down to the top of green, up to the red, down to the top of green, so on and so forth. And to four, we let that heart rate drop all the way down to 99 again, and then another set and another set. So this is how we can use our, our heart rate training. This is how we can use our, am I training for power or am I training for capacity? Or I can take an entire workout and build both power and capacity together. Taking a look at some final points. So with our heart rate, and this is something that JK and I did in the lab together um, for one summer, is that we used the time it took for my heart rate to return to 99 as a measure of fitness. So I would do a I would do a workout I would do a two minute all out sprint on a on a stationary bike get my heart rate up over 180 and then we would measure the time it would take my heart rate to go from 180 back down to 99 and over time that the the duration of that that interval between heart rate red, heart rate you know, over 180, and then drop into 99, that decreased precipitously over the course of that training protocol. So for my, for my sports science people out there, when we're working with our athletes, look at how long it takes the heart rate to return to either top of green or to the 99 value. And we're gonna, you're gonna see, well, is capacity is my aerobic capacity, is my anaerobic capacity increasing? If it is, the time to recover, the time for recovery is gonna decrease. And so, and then that's gonna be a, 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 another data point that we can add to our analysis. The more data points we have to look at training effects, the more data points we have to look at how my athlete is progressing, 
the, the better, the more rich our analysis is going to be. Now, in terms of limitations, because this is so individually specific, and not only is it individually specific, it's specific from day to day. On, on one day, if I were to, I'm going to go back one slide here. If I were to give this workout to the athlete that did it this day, well, their heart rate may drop to the green in 30 seconds, but in terms of when we're building capacity. However, on a day where they're a little more fatigued, it may take them a minute or it may take them or it may take them two minutes between sets some days or other days it may take 90 seconds between sets if they're not completely recovered if they're um, we're, we're going to get into heart rate variability if they're if their heart rate variability is either too high or too low they haven't recovered from previous workouts so this time to recovery is going to take maybe a little bit longer or a little bit less so if I'm working with a group, if I'm working with a team, I really can't use something this individually specific. I'm going to have to go with the standard work to rest ratios. And for them, I'm, for those, I'm going to refer you to the National Strength and Conditioning Association's recommendations. They do a really good, the NSCA does an excellent job outlining if you're looking for aerobic power, this is the work to rest ratio. If you are looking for anaerobic power, that's the work to rest ratio. So my limitations here, I'm going to use these with individuals. I'm going to use them with a small group setting. If I have a heart rate monitor, it's going to be excellent. If I have a, uh, if I have a small group, say I have four or five athletes riding stationary bikes, don't have heart rate monitors, we're going to use breathing. When they're doing their interval, they want to do their interval so hard that they have to breathe through their mouth. If they are, and then when they're done, they want to recover to the point where they're able to breathe solely through their nose. Once they breathe through their nose, they're ready to go. That would be how I would do power training. Capacity training with nasal breathing is a little bit more difficult. There you may have to refer to work to rest ratios. And that is the final slide for today. I thank everybody for showing up. I thank Billy Ward for the inspiration. And to get in contact with me, you can reach out Instagram, Facebook, Twitter at Run Bike Doc. Questions, comments, anything that you want to see, any topics that you'd like me to cover. If you got any questions, you can email me at runbikedoc at gmail.com. And to get a recorded, a recorded archive of this one or anything that you may have missed, swing on over to YouTube and type in the search engine doc hickey and you will come to my page hit that button and subscribe i thank everybody for showing up today have a great weekend have a great week and we will be back at it next week one o'clock thanks for coming have a great day